My name is Tochi Onyebuchi, and I am the author of Riot Baby and most recently Skin Folk. And I'll be moderating tonight's conversation with G. Willow Wilson, Brian Mitchell, and Amindar Dhaliwal. We're broadcasting on Crowdcast, and we want you to be a part of the conversation. The chat is open for your comments. PEN America staff will also be answering your questions in the chat throughout the event and sharing information about the participants. And if you have questions, there is a Q&A. There is a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, this event will be live captioned. Uh, please see links in the chat for access. And we will be providing periodic visual descriptions for low vision folks in our audience. Right now, we are in a frame on the left side of the screen. We see branding for PEN America and the PEN World Voices Festival in the corners. And there's a chat with lots of folks on the side where people are telling us where they're watching from. So let's get started with the event. Uh, tonight, G. Willow Wilson, Brian Mitchell, and Aminder Dhaliwal will be in conversation to discuss the graphic novel and how the medium can expose injustices and offer a vision for a better world. Uh, Aminder Dhaliwal has worked uh, as a cartoonist, animator, and graphic novelist for Cartoon Network, Nickelodeon, and Disney Television. Disney TV animation. Uh, her 2018 graphic novel, Wonder World, was nominated for, 20, for the 2018 Ignatz Award for Outstanding Online Comic. Uh, G. Willow Wilson is the author of the acclaimed novel, The Bird King, uh, co-creator of the Hugo and American Book Award winning series, Miss Marvel, and has written for some of the world's best known superhero comic book series, including the X-Men, Superman, and Wonder Woman. Brian K. Mitchell is Assistant Professor of History at the University of Arkansas Little Rock and an Associate Faculty Member at the Anderson Institute on Race and Ethnicity. I will now introduce the authors and ask them to share their pronouns and a brief visual description of themselves. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm currently wearing a black t-shirt with a picture of Killmonger on it captioned, hey, auntie. Uh, so Aminder, could you kick us off? Sure. Uh, I am Aminda Dollywall, author and illustrator of Cyclopedia Exotica and Woman World. Uh, and my pronouns are she and her. I am a South Asian woman with curly black hair to my shoulders. Um, and I'm wearing a black top with a multicolored cardigan and I have dimples. And uh, Willow. Hi, thank you. My name is Willow Wilson. I am the writer of uh, books with pictures, including Miss Marvel, Wonder Woman, Superman and the X-Men, uh, as well as books without pictures, including The Bird King and Aleph the Unseen. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a white woman with brownish blonde hair. I'm wearing a gray sweater and I'm sitting in front of a bookcase. And lastly, but certainly not leastly, uh, Brian. Hello, my name is Brian Mitchell, and uh, my pronouns are he and him, and I'm wearing a gray suit with a white shirt, and if you look over my shoulder, uh, you'll see my most recent book, Monumental. Fantastic. I have, I'm, I'm such a big fan of all your work, like Monumental was such a meaningful read, Brian. I'm in there, I could gush all day <laughs> yeah. about Woman World and, and Cyclopedia Exotica, like just amazing. And, and Willow, I mean, Miss Marvel, history making, history making. But um, I am here to ask questions, um, so I will keep the fanboying to a minimum, but I wanted to, to get us started by asking, you know, why the medium of graphic novels? You know, there are a number of ways, I think, in which, you know, this, the stories that you were telling in each of your works could have been told. And I don't know, you know, a few, a few of you have actually worked in other media. So why did it make sense, you know, particularly for, for you know, your work, Willow, and your work, Aminder, and you know the story of Oscar Dunn, Brian. Um, why did it make sense to use the graphic novel as a uh, medium? And Aminder, before you answer, um, I wanted to put up a, a picture from uh, Cyclopedia Exotica uh, so the fans can see what we're talking about. 
Sure, yeah. Um, for me, um, you can see an image here from Cyclopedia Exotica. It's a panel right from near the beginning of the book where the characters are, who are Cyclops are discussing how in a two-eyed world, uh, the Cyclops is marketed a two-eyed look. And so they're walking past this panel where <clears throat> this character has gotten eye surgery. But for me, the reason I chose to get into graphic novels is because a grown up being an artist, I've always drawn, that is just how I express myself. Um, there are times where I could probably spend twice as long trying to write an expression <laughs> rather than just draw it, because that is just how I see things and how I communicate. Fantastic. Um, Brian, uh, and before you answer, Brian, I want to uh, put up a slide from, from Monumental. I grew up loving comics. In fact, uh, uh, BSA Comics was my home away from home where I grew up. Uh, but when I became an academic, everything turned to this very academic writing. And I discovered uh, about two years after I uh, completed my dissertation uh, by looking at the dashboard. And there was an author's dashboard that the university used so we could map who's looking at our work, um, I discovered that a lot of high schools were pulling up my dissertation. And I got a mysterious email from a young student wherein he uh, wanted to thank me for writing this dissertation. And I, I asked, well, how old are you? He was calling with his father. And, you know, he just, he just, he said he was, uh, I believe it's 14 or 15. And uh, after, you know, checking him out, asking a few questions, I asked, well, how could I improve um, the text and make it more accessible for younger audiences? And he suggested uh, a graphic history. And I had been a student of Trevor Getz, who wrote Albina, really that first graphic history to be accepted in the ivory tower. And I said, well, this is possible. And I began at that point uh, trying to uh, put together and collaborate with an artist that could uh, bring to life the dissertation. Fantastic, and and Willow. So I like I imagine Willow like that you know given you're dealing with a Marvel property, you know the answer <laughs> might be a little different. But at the same time, you know a lot of the themes that do arise in Miss Marvel, you know, are themes that could be explored in other media, but they seem particularly well expressed uh, in that comic. Well, thank you. Yeah, I I, I think. Um, you know, when you're dealing with superhero comics, because you're kind of living in a shared universe that is usually older than you are, uh, it it is kind of a, a different proposition. But I think really a, a flashpoint genera generation after generation within superhero comics is what do you express with these characters and how does that change depending on your situation, depending on world history, uh, depending on the audience. So what I think is unique about superhero comics as a visual medium is you get these symbols in the forms of these characters that stay the same decade after decade, yet the stories shift, the, the mission shifts, uh, the language shifts. And so to me, you, you almost get a kind of very tidy visual history of pop culture through superhero comics because you can see that evolution both in the stories that are being told and in the art from decade to decade through the lens of these characters that are the closest things to collective mythology that we have in pop culture in the US. Amazing. And so like before uh, before I get to the next question, and actually this is this is one willow that I want you to kick us off with. You know, I want I want to see uh, you know, a quick page from Miss Marvel. Um and the question that I have, uh, sort of spinning off of what you've just said, is that all all of your works seem to deal in one way or another with the theme of heroism. Now, whether this is, you know, literally in costumed form or, you know, even in more sort of domestic settings or more sort of quotidian settings. And so I was wondering if you could all speak about heroism, you know, in your work. And is this something that you think consciously of? Um, is this something that you grapple with? Um, and 
how do you how do you find it's best expressed in the graphic novel medium? And so Willow, if you could if you could start. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I think for me personally, being a, a hero often involves making choices that are not easy or or simple or even obvious um, and without expectation of reward simply because it's the right thing to do. Um, you know, I, I think that's something that's especially compelling to people um, in times of great change when that path is not clear. And when just sort of doing what you're told or doing what's always been done or, you know, maintaining the status quo uh, is not necessarily the good thing or the right thing. And so there is no clear path forward. You have to kind of hew it out of the rock. Um, and I think, I think that's reflected in the fact that uh, you know, we in the U.S. As, as a culture seem to have this almost endless appetite for stories about heroism, where the, whether it comes in the form of superheroes um, or, uh, you know, sort of teen dystopia novels where you, you really have to fight the system and start over from scratch in order to, to bring about a more just world. Um, so I don't know, you know, on a conscious on a conscious level, I'm not sure that I set out to ask some grand question like what is a hero or, or you know like uh, how how can i sort of add to this this conversation but i think because i like like a lot of people uh, these days spend a lot of time thinking about the big issues what what went wrong how do we fix it i think the the question of heroism comes up subconsciously whether you kind of mean it to or not because we're all kind of called upon to make difficult choices It's hard Certainly. to follow. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, well, so I and I, I so I wanted I want to ask sort of this the same question of Brian because Oscar Dunn is like a literal hero. This Reconstruction era, uh, you know, politician and legislator and, and just groundbreaking figure. And your graphic novel was the first time that I had encountered his name. So when you were when you were telling the story. You know, did you think of him in terms of sort of heroism and the the things that he was doing at the time, or or you know, did his status as a hero sort of come about as a result of the the way that you wanted to tell this story? Uh, it actually, there's a biographical sort of connection to Dunn in the graphic uh, novel. Uh, I grew up sort of in the shadow of this figure uh, who. I knew was very famous. My family knew was very famous um, and very important to our history. But virtually no one else knew him unless you were a historian. Uh, you probably had never heard of Dunn. And the idea of being born a slave and being considered uh, possibly for the vice presidency of the United States in a single lifetime is amazing. And the things that he was able to accomplish um, are just breathtaking. And the notion that people purposely tried to bury this identity uh, because uh, they wanted to ascribe an identity and very much the, the way that people want to ascribe things to the Cyclopses or uh, Miss Marvel, you know, feels the pressure of being Islamic in a, in a society where the majority of people are not. Um, he's fighting an identity that's being placed on him. So this idea that African-Americans could not or weren't capable of achieving, um, he becomes uh, an icon breaking figure there. Mm. Yeah, no, certainly. And so like, Aminda, reading reading Cyclopedia Exotica and even, even Woman World, like in each of the stories, I felt like I was in countering heroes, but it was a more sort of domestic quotidian, like, let me make it to the next day type of heroism. So I was wondering right. if you could speak on, you know, some of the, you know, some of those situations that you put those characters in. <laughs> That's really generous of you. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't call my characters heroes probably, um, but they, they are, yeah, they're the, just they're everyday people. Um, it's, it's slice of life. It's just the little moments. And Maybe that that's what heroes are, but um, that's where I kind of find the fun and the joy of like 
exploring those worlds is like the everyday little moments and not the not the big grand swings just the the daily life of these people in these these different worlds how oh, amazing and so uh, i so on that on that line with regards to you know the situations and and whatnot did it you know, there's a very episodic structure to both books. And was there a reason that you alighted on that? I mean, I, you know, particularly with Woman World, I could have continued. I, I loved those characters so much. I could have kept reading about them for another hundred pages easily. Um, similarly with Cyclopedia Exotica, um, and especially the twins, Jean and Gray. Um, I see what you did there. Um, uh, so, how did you come to the end points that you got to with both of those books? Oh man, you know, a lot of it was kind of like a feeling. It was because you're just like exploring these slice of life daily moments and there is no real end point written into them structurally, but knowing that like these characters are better off having a good, probably tasty ending that kind of puts it, puts it, uh, gives them a kind of a, a good feeling for the audience to end on. And it was harder with Woman World because I went into it without any sort of an outline or structure. But with Cyclopedia Exotica, I did kind of have an arc for each character. And it was more about when I later would make it into a book from the online version was how to put all these stories together and have them flow um, and still get to that kind of satisfying ending in the same way. While online I can like, kind of just talk to my audience directly. It's in the book form, I had to like re kind of try and imagine that with a narrative. So a lot of it was just like the artsy answer of like a feeling of what felt right. Um, but I kind of knew where these characters were heading from the beginning. Okay, it, it, so like similarly, uh, Brian, I, I don't, I don't know that it's a spoiler to say that Oscar Dunn um, dies because he lived a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. Eighteen seventy one, he died, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know he's not a vampire, um, right? But the you know, but Monumental doesn't exactly end at his death. You know, there's a little bit that you know, there's there's stuff that comes after, and so I was wondering um, why you felt it was important to to include that in the sort of arc of his story. Uh, well, first, I'd like to talk a little bit about reconstruction and saying that reconstruction, an understanding of reconstruction now helps students to better understand what we're living through and the importance of protesting. Uh, many of the laws that are being passed today are in, in various states and many of the conflicts that are happening. Um, it helps you better understand uh, what happened on January 6th and the importance of us making sure that we, we write that narrative and we write that narrative as it happened, not uh, an imagined narrative or a censored narrative. And it's this is extremely important that students know that there's a connection between the past and the present. And that's why there's that ending section uh, in, in the book. And I want to give too much away. Um, that sort of connects the past to the present. Mm, definitely. And and Willow, I guess it's sort of a an inverse of the question. How do you figure endpoints in your story, given that this is a character that's very much ongoing? Um, that's very much having a life after your, you know, involvement. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think that's the great hat trick of superhero stories, uh, is, is that if when you create a new character, it happens to be successful. And, and I think Ms. Marvel is, is sort of like the, the 10% of the iceberg you can see above the waterline of many, many superheroes that kind of never made it off the ground. Um, but there, there did come a point in sort of the, let's see, the first, what was it? We, I did 60 issues, me and Sana and, uh, and, and the artists who worked on the book. So that's like five years of material. And at some point toward the end of that, uh, when it became clear that Ms. Marvel was, was going to be one of the superheroes who sticks around, um, I kind of switched mentally from telling a story with a concrete beginning, middle and end 
to stewarding this character into a place where her world was opening up in such a way that other artists and other writers could take this character and run with her and tell you know, very different stories and, and take her in different directions and put her on different teams. Um, so there was a big opening up, I think, that happened in, in like the last year where we were sort of deliberately trying to make her horizons broader and broader um, because it, it was like succession planning. Um, you know, I, I think if some people in superhero comics get a little bit territorial and, and they want to kind of kill everybody off so that nobody can play with their toys. Um, I didn't want to be like that. You know, like I was I was thrilled that Ms. Marvel had found the audience that she did. And um, so I wanted to make that transition seamless and, and you know, put as many tools out there for the, the next writer to use as possible. No, and, and she is thriving. She <laughs> is. So, she is. It's unbelievable. She is, she is. <laughs> it really, no, it's been, it's been so wondrous to watch the, the, the growth of that character, you know, of Kamala Khan and, and also the way in which she's permeated the public consciousness. I, it's yeah. so inspiring and just yeah. cool and so wonderfully reflective of, you know, the world that I, and I think a lot of us recognize outside of our windows. Um, but Brian, something you said actually leads me to my next question. And it was about the connection that you wanted to make explicit between um, the period during which Oscar Dunn lived and did his work and now. And so in all of your stories, there is this element of, you know, to a certain extent and to varying degrees, uh, allegory, or at least, you know, when you're telling um, a story that you know, whether in, in form or in content is a little bit divorced from the world that we're occupying now. And how do you maintain this balance where, you know, you're engaging in social issues and you very clearly have something to say, but you don't want it to be buried beneath layers of allegory so that the message gets missed. Um, how do you, how do you maintain that balance? And I guess, you know, Brian, we could start with you. Well, um, it's a little bit different for a historian. <laughs> I, I have to deal within a framework of, of facts and documents, things that we know happened and sources that are available to me. Uh, I always want to deal with a counterfactual, however. I, I remember as a kid, there was a wonderful um, comic called What If that uh, proposes, you know, alternative realities and uh, you know I, I would love to have done a what if with Dunn. you know what if Dunn had lived and become uh vice president to grant and then become president that would have been fantastic but uh i don't know how usable that would have been in a classroom <laughs> so i'm confined by uh reality which makes me sort of envy uh willow and amender because and yourself because whatever you can imagine can happen. And, uh, you know, I wish I could have that ability in graphic history. I might have to call up my editor after this panel and let her know about now this simmering uh, Oscar Dunn alternative history idea <laughs> that I might have to write now. Um, <laughs> but, you know, Aminder, with the, you know, with the, with the, you know, Cyclopedia Exotica, it like, I feel like there is this trap that a lot of speculative fiction writers fall into where they slot in one prejudice for another or one marginalized identity for another. It's like, oh, you know, this person, you know, comes from this region of the world and they're, 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 you know, they're the, the target of bigotry, but it's not really ex examined in the story world or it's like, oh, these people have like world destroying superpowers, um, but we're going to antagonize and oppress them and as though that is, you know, similar to, you know, being non-white or, you know, being non-Protestant, right? Um, shooting laser beams out of your eyes is all of a sudden, you know, the same as being black, apparently. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um but being black is pretty cool. Um uh, but I I want to I want to ask you about, you know, what was it like navigating some of that with Cyclopedia Exotica where because it, it really felt like this was built into the story world and it wasn't just like, oh, let me slot in one marginalized identity for another. Um well, you know, I well, thank you first of all. Um 
it was, you know, with Woman World, I was so on the nose. It was literally called Woman World and it was all about gender. <laughs> so I allowed myself to this time, maybe instead of talking specifically about race, to kind of slot in this Cyclops and this world in which um, it's two eyes versus one eye. Um, but a lot of the stories are specific to my experiences. They are microaggressions that I have experienced. Um, and then some of them are my friends. Um, some of them are just, you know, my commentary on things. But then the world kind of took on the it kind of asked for other stories. And when it is all about this eye count, um, and eyes in general, it, I started bring, bringing more kind of sci-fi stories in there with the, the surgeries and stuff, which started specifically more about this like sci-fi fantasy element of like, oh, that'd be interesting in this world. But there are completely real versions of those um, right. that like I'm mirroring. So it was kind of exciting to get to remove the the baggage of the thing I was talking about, race specifically, and kind of hide behind this metaphor <laughs> and um, both, I guess, hide, but also just make it a lot more accessible. Um, because I went into it specifically thinking it was race, um, but I then got plenty of fans who reached out to me and told me that to them it was the queer experience. And I was like, oh, that's not how I wrote it because that isn't my experience, but it's so amazing and also kind of sad to see us all be like, we've all experienced this microaggression. <laughs> so it's been nice in, in community building, but I think I just allowed myself to explore a different way to tell a story this time. No, definitely. I mean, it's there were so many points that were absolutely on the nose. I mean, you have you have one character who's in a, a I guess, an inter eye relationship. Um, her, <laughs> she's a cyclops, and her husband is two eyes, and she's getting ready to give birth. And there's a you know a two eye woman who walks into the room and is asking her all these questions about cyclops anatomy and all these really invasive and personal questions. And you know she's you know she's glad for the opportunity to educate this person on you know all the different you know the processes and whatnot and giving birth and what that's like. And then she and then she asks the two eyes woman very basic question about her pregnancy, and the woman's like, "Whoa, that's super personal information. I don't even know you like that." And uh, I yeah. and like the way that resonated with me, I was just I was I had to put the book down at that point. Right. I had to take a walk on <laughs> and return to it. Um, but so. So, so Willow, I guess a you know a variation of this question is with with Kamala Khan. You have, you know, a hero that's from a very different demographic background from the vast majority of uh, not just the Marvel pantheon, but American superheroes in general. And how did you, you know, how did you navigate making, you know, telling her stories in a way that felt authentic to her, without necessarily saying, okay, this is a book about this is a book about being a Muslim girl from Jersey, right? <laughs> it seemed, cause I feel like it very easily could have been like, oh, all the villains are, are themed like that and et cetera, et cetera. But there seemed to be this really cool balance where you had it, where there was, it was just this Muslim girl from Jersey having these adventures and like being a superhero and growing into powers and everything. So how did you, how did you walk that? I guess if there is a line to be walked in that situation, how did you walk it? Uh, very, very carefully. <laughs> um, you, you know, Miss Marvel began as uh, a very nebulous idea um, when sort of Sana Amanat, who is the editor and co-creator, called me and was like, "Hey, you and I are the only two Muslim women working in in superhero comics, like in the whole country. Why don't Why don't we do a book <laughs> with a Muslim protagonist?" Um, and you know, that's a that's actually it. it it seems very specific, but that's a very big, broad category of, of people because, um, especially in the United States, you know, in the United States, uh, Muslim can mean is, uh, you know, a, a black Muslim from Philadelphia. It can mean a first generation uh, Muslim like Kamala Khan from a, a South Asian background. It can mean, uh, you know, like an, an Arab family that's been here for generations, uh, you know, like some of the Michigan communities, or it can be a white convert like me, who sort of is, is a relic of the 9-11 era. You know, it can mean so many different things. Um, and we had to kind of choose 
one person who was then going to carry the burden of representation for all of those people for all time. So it was a really big ask. <laughs> and you know, <laughs> no like, pressure. Oh, yeah, no pressure whatsoever. Ultimately, a lot of Sana's experiences uh, informed directly or indirectly Kamal's experiences. But I think it was important to me and to Sana um, that this be a character who, no matter what your background, whether you wanted to or not, you would see a little bit of your own experience in her. And that's why locating her so precisely was important. Uh, I grew up in New Jersey, so did Sana, uh, you know, at around the same time. So, you know, New Jersey was a very obvious place. Um, and there are gonna be things that you're gonna face in that very specific environment that are going to be, uh, some of them are specific to her being a, a Muslim girl growing up in that environment. And some of them are gonna be more universal. Um, and uh, it, it was important to have both of those threads because as a, as a superhero, she is, is kind of a symbol to her whole city and then eventually to a much larger group of people. And, you know, I think the way that we get there, or at least for me, it was, it was finding those bits of her particular experience that anybody could kind of pick up and glom onto, you know, and what Sana, the way Sana described it at the beginning when we were still in development was find whatever her with great power comes great responsibility is like, like, let's do the Muslim version of that. And I'm like, God, I don't know what that is. Um, and then six months later, you know, I was trying to whittle this, this idea down to something that could fit in a world balloon. And it ended up being good is not a thing you are. It's a thing you do. Um, and that to me was the little nugget of, of sort of the, the, the practice of Islam that anybody could pick up and take with them. Kind of like there's little bits of, of sort of Christianity in Lord of the Rings that you can kind of pick up and take with you, whether you're an atheist or a Christian or anything else. Um, so, you know, like on some level, again, it was a big ask. That's kind of what we were trying to get to is what can we give you, whoever you are, that is portable, that you can take from this character and apply to anything in your life. Mm, uh, absolutely amazing. Yeah, no, it, I, it's so funny in so many, in so many of your stories, um, and even in the story of Oscar Dunn, you know, there, you know, there are these characters that I'm encountering that are so different from me, um, in many, many, many ways. Um, you know, Oscar Dunn having lived, uh, you know, the couple centuries before I did, um, the world being slightly different at that time. Um, although, you know, how different, we don't know. Uh, but they were all, you know, all your your protagonists, all your characters were incredibly, incredibly relatable. Um, so one, one question that I want to ask, and this is, I guess, you know, somewhat of a craft question is, when you were writing your works, were there any particular you know, stories or graphic novels or even stories outside the medium that you drew upon for inspiration or that informed the telling of your work. And Aminder, we can start with you. Um, I always feel like I'm suddenly being picked on in class. <laughs> I come up with my references. Um, you know, a big influence for me has always been Persepolis in it being this black and white graphic novel with just so much story packed in in these little moments of uh, Marjan's life. Um, and I, I've just always loved that style of storytelling. And that book is just somewhere behind me here, <laughs> if I was better at pointing. Um, it, it's just had such a profound influence on me. And to me, it's always shocking how much story is packed in to that novel. Um, and then the other one is uh, Jillian Tamaki, Superman Magic Academy. These are like all indie, but like, it's just, again, the same type of storytelling where it's just like slice of life, little moments and build on them. Um, and then like, of course, they're the bigger kind, like there's Calvin and Hobbes and just like, just again, the same ideas where before you know it, you're like 10 comics in and you have, you know exactly what the rest of the world that you don't get to ever see in those panels. You just know what it looks like. So it's comics like that where you can take an idea and explore it almost like a like a you're seeing the seed of a brainstorm where it's just the single idea and then from there has stemmed out all these different comics and all these little moments because that's just how I work. 
that has really been inspiring seeing that in other comics. So, so teacher, that is my answer <laughs> for being called on first. <laughs> very, very good answer. A plus. Um, I'm a very forgiving professor. Um, so, so Willow, you mentioned, you know, the with great power comes great responsibility moment. So were there any particular sort of um, flashpoints or totems in, you know, whether it's the Marvel canon or, or other sort of aspects of superhero mythology in general uh, that informed uh, the Miss Marvel story? Oh, yeah. Um, you know, there, there definitely are. I, I think there's sort of three archetypes when it comes to classic superhero stories. Uh, and to one degree or another, a lot of the, the superheroes who sort of make it to that tier of, of, of universal consciousness where everybody recognizes them comes from one of those. One is sort of the Superman, you seem like you're just an ordinary guy from Kansas, but actually you're the heir of an alien empire and you're gonna wake up with superhero powers one day. Uh, you know, there's sort of that archetype, the hidden king. Um, I'm not gonna go to Joseph Campbell, I, I, I promise. There's also, uh, <laughs> there's there's kind of the anti-hero uh, Batman one where maybe you were born with everything, but it's taken away. And your story is a story of revenge. How do you, you know, are you gonna try to call, claw it all back, how does it affect you? Um, and then there's sort of the superhero by accident, which is the Peter Parker model, where you have no great destiny, you were not born into great wealth, you have no hidden, you know, royal lineage that's gonna manifest someday. You're really just a kid, but you happen to be the one in your class who got bitten by the radioactive spider. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, you're not a billionaire Tony Stark, you can't build yourself a mech suit, you can't develop a, a really complex alter ego. You have to kind of manage these powers that you've got with ordinary teenage life. Um, and so, you know, that is the DNA that I think Kamala is really built around most obviously and people have made the Peter Parker uh, Ms Marvel uh, you know parallel in various places so I think that's that is a real thing in terms of how her story was built um you know we we took a very meta approach with this character because she grows up in a world where superheroes are a very real non-metaphorical thing they show up in the tabloids you see them having battles across the river in Manhattan. Um, so she, you know, she writes fanfic about these fictional characters that are to her something quite real. Um, so there's, you know, definitely a lot of the, the humor in the series is very metatextual. Uh, you know, she knows some bits of the lives of these superheroes, but not others. So, you know, she, uh, the first time she meets Wolverine, she gushes to him about this fanfic that you know was was upvoted in some website that's about you know Jean Grey and Scott Summers romantic getaway in Paris and he's like I'm <laughs> get me out of here <laughs> so you know like when you have a character who's sort of the nth generation of this uh, world you can then look back and make tongue-in-cheek remarks about the 70 years of history that have come before which is a lot of fun <laughs> I I mean that I have to say that's one of the aspects of the Miss Marvel comic that I love the most. Just like all the the cross referencing and all the I just the Easter eggs. I'm a big I'm a big fan of Easter eggs, and so thank you for all of those. Oh, um, for me as a geek, it was it was fun to be able to do. <laughs> so I, I I don't know if we if we lost Brian if he's if he's still here, but. Um, I, I see some of the questions, some of the audience questions. Ah, here we go. Uh, yeah. Speak of the devil. Um, so, I'm sorry. No, no, no worries. Um, so, Brian, I want to I want to toss the question over to you. You know, were there any particular you know graphic histories that you went to for for inspiration or that informed how you told the story of Monumental? I can't say that I went to other graphic histories for. Um, what I did was uh, very, very different, and uh, there weren't a lot of examples to follow. Um, I was influenced, however, by a number of historians and their work. Um, Eric Foner uh, being one, John Hope Franklin being another, and uh, the way they told uh, stories about Reconstruction. Uh, Dr. Holt in, at the University of Chicago was also one of my heroes growing up. 
and uh, following those sort of narratives and uh, following their uh, type of research uh, helped me um, to, to write the narrative. Definitely. I mean, shout out to Eric Foner. I mean, it's, is anybody doing reconstruction better than him? Like, I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, but we're, so we're starting to get uh, some audience questions. And so I want to, I want to ask the group um, one of the questions, and this is actually something that I've been wondering about as well, not just in the context of this panel, but in the context of my own work. Um, how do you keep a balance between humor, sincerity, and social critique uh, in your work, especially when writing for audiences that include younger readers? Um, and so, Willow, we could start with you. Oh, you know, this is this is something that I actually had to revise when I realized shortly after Ms. Marvel launched um, that even though we'd sort of build it as YA, people were reading it with their seven and eight year olds. And at that point, I was like, okay, no guns. There's a gun in the first act of Ms. Marvel. And, uh, you know, so all guns were then gone. Um, I, yeah, I sort of changed some of the framing of some of the issues uh, to make them, uh, you know, a little bit easier to follow for, for younger readers. I think that was, that was a sort of wake up call for me because, you know, I, I had done a very limited amount of YA before that and I didn't realize that kids really like to read up. They like to read about people who are slightly older than they are. So if you're writing about a 15 year old, it's likely that it's gonna be read by 12 year olds. If you're writing about a 12 year old, it's gonna be read by eight year olds. Um, and that was something that would not have occurred to me until people started bringing their very small children to uh, signings and things like that. So, you know, I think it's, it's something I'm not done learning, but I, it is a real uh, challenge, I think, as as a writer to figure out a way to say things that will be meaningful to that audience. It isn't just you kind of rehashing your own troubled youth because um, th there is a difference. You know, I, I think there's a couple of different ways to write for young readers. And one is like, this is catharsis for me. And another one is okay, I, I need some catharsis, but how do I do that without kind of dumping a lot of stuff on these readers that they can't handle or can't relate to or can't understand? Um, and only a very small part of that is language. I think some of it is how do you break down the story? You know, how many different components does it have? Um, you know, what's the, what's the takeaway? Is there something concrete that you're giving them that they can use in their own lives instead of just leaving it kind of gray and open-ended the way that you might be tempted to do for an older audience. Um, and, and it is not easy to do. It is not easy to do. And I'm not always sure that I pulled it off, frankly. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's such a, it's such an interesting space to live at the center of, you know, especially right. when looking at younger readers. And Brian, you've spoken, you know, explicitly about how Monumental is very much uh, in many ways meant as a, a tool for younger readers or something that can make uh, the history, not just of Oscar Dunn, but of Reconstruction more accessible to them. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about, about audience and about balancing those concerns of humor and sincerity and social critique in that work. It's funny that you use the word balance uh, when we talk about history and African-American history. Um, as a teacher, and, and, and I, I constantly have an influx of new students. So I'm able to critique, you know, the state of what they're learning by the condition that they come, the amount of information they come to my class with. And things really haven't changed very much. When I was in high school, there was very little discussion of reconstruction. I saw um, very few he heroes uh, like myself. I saw very few narratives that explained my condition in America. And uh, students are often amazed when they get to college and then they begin to understand how things actually got the way they are. And I think that it's really, we're starting too late informing children about their past and telling accurate narratives about history. And, and I'm thankful for 1619. And you hate to say you're thankful for the turmoil that surrounds something, but 
I, I'm thankful that they had the courage to do something like that and that there's been this sort of vocal back and forth on it. History is quite often the perspective of what happened about the past and only one perspective has been historically uh, told. And if you only teach uh, one segment of history, it's easy for people to imagine a world um, being one way when it actually isn't. Um, so what I've devoted myself to and a lot of my work lately is making sure that narratives, uh, and they're not just African-American narratives, but narratives of marginalized people are, are told. And uh, America's a, a tapestry and, and it, all these threads are within it. Um, there is no typical American, you know, even though if we watch Hollywood movies, we would assume, you know, uh, Tom Cruise is a typical American or Brad Pitt is the typical American. Our Aniston is the typical American. Um, there is no typical American. We're all immigrants here, unless you're a Native American. So the, the, this notion that we should only hear, have these patriotic narratives that um, enshrine us with heroes that look a certain way or from a certain background is uh, is important to dismantle that, that, to have an understanding that we all contributed to making America great. Certainly. Uh, wow, you took us to church. <laughs> uh, Amanda, there's there's so much sincerity and humor and social critique in in your work. How do you, but it like all works and it all feels like cohesive and not like, you know, treacly or didactic? Like, how do you, how did you, tell the class, how did you pull it off? <laughs> Oh, um, you know, I, I come from a children's animation that is originally, uh, that's actually most of my day job, um, if it's not adult animation. Um, and so I um, love speaking to younger viewers um, and then younger readers, because um, I think they, they understand so much more than we think they do. And so often it is just about, um, simplifying complex ideas or um, pacing them out in a specific way, but everyone kind of gets to the right conclusions in like, in ways that you just don't see coming. Um, they're always smarter than you think, all audiences. <laughs> um, and then in terms of like social critique and sincerity, I I don't try to be preachy, but I, I don't think you can have any sort of good social critique without sincerity. And then I think personally, if you, true sincere moments are also usually quite funny. Um, there are the, some of the dark moments in my life that like my go-to is making a joke. And so I feel like there is just humor naturally inbuilt to some like really dark or like complicated issues. So I feel like they're all kind of the same idea and it's just kind of like how you lay them out. No, definitely. I mean, so many of the, so many of the, I guess the the micro stories, particularly Encyclopedia Exotica, read or like they had the structure of jokes, like you can tell, like they really, they were very like sincere and in many, in, in many instances like emotional situations. But then there would be like the twist at the end is like no, they didn't want, they didn't want the you know the dog because it was a black lab they wanted it right. because it was the cyclops dog like, yeah. <laughs> um, it's much so like, like sadder on my end when um i'm not even laughing and i'm just like very seriously moving the panel around to see like where it should go and drawing a cyclops dog as well <laughs> i mean i i i i'm very i am incredibly happy with how it turned out no and i think yeah, the fact that you were fantastic. able to knock it out the park yeah and like you knocked it out the park so consistently throughout the book like it was it was amazing um sorry i'm, I'm like gushing again i'm getting back <laughs> into fanboy mode okay next I question <laughs> so uh another question in the chat and this is something that you know you've all touched on to a certain extent uh throughout the panel but this question makes it explicit um how do you write nuanced characters that feel fresh given that in comics historically there's often been this this very manichaean dichotomy between good and evil uh willow oh um you know i i think 
the fact that we think that there is that kind of Manichaean dichotomy in comics is a sign that a lot of the classic uh, comic book writers and artists actually did their job too well. Because if you look at a lot of the classic villains who are still popular today uh, and still causing controversy to, controversy today, uh, the reason that they stuck around and that beca they became so iconic is because there's something deeply sympathetic built into their backgrounds. There's a suggestion that if, if this thing had happened to you, you might have turned into a villain rather than a hero. And that's what I think makes them so valuable. Um, is that they sort of the outward face, you know, sort of the, the the marquee image of these characters is like, yeah, these guys are evil and bizarre, and they have a twisted vision for the fate of humanity. Uh, they've got weird costumes, but you know, when you get into their origin stories, there's something in there that is is will trigger some kind of empathy in the reader to say, hey, wait a minute, like you're right, that is really messed up, and it's it's the fact that you agree with those people on some level that makes them compelling as villains. Um, so I, I think it's it's actually a more complex dichotomy than it appears on the surface, because uh, the flip side of that, of course, is that superheroes are constantly being put in situations where they're having to confront their own rules about what they will and won't do. Will they use lethal force? Uh, okay. Are they always using their powers for good? Uh, you know, it's, 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 and it's that tension where those lines are not exactly clear between who is the hero and who is the villain that I think makes a good comic good. Not that I, not that it's always possible, <laughs> but that's the goal. <laughs> My mind is, I've never had anybody break it down like that for me before, and especially the like sympathy villain aspect. Sorry, I'm going to be thinking about that for a while now. But, but Brian, you were very enthusiastically nodding along to that. So, what are your what are your thoughts on on you know on Willow's answer, but also the greater question of you know the the good evil dichotomy in comics and and where we're at now. Uh I always felt bad for like petty thieves in Gotham. You know, like, <laughs> the poor right. kid died, lived in a poor neighborhood. He couldn't find a job. So he <laughs> My goodness, Batman made that guy's life hell. You know? <laughs> uh, it's much easier in in my piece because I, I deal with. I mean, we we're dealing with difficult histories. We're dealing with massacres. We're dealing with people that are withholding rights from. Um, the newly emancipated freemen. We're uh, dealing with uh, treachery, uh, political treachery, on a level um, th that I guess, I guess we're seeing uh, or, or we've seen recently in news stories. So I think it's a little easier for me than it is, you know, having to create this from nothing, from scratch. These people are actually there. I'm able to follow the narratives and newspaper articles. Uh, so I, I think I have it a lot easier uh, than Willow has it. I mean, Willow, you do a fantastic job of making up these villains. Um, all I have to do is find the villains, you know, and, and read stories about them. And oh, oh my God, I can't believe that person did that. I, I can't believe that, you know, he would run on a platform with blacks and then get to the point where they've made him governor and then veto a bill that gives them civil rights. You know that that in itself is a, a a heinous thing to do, but it's something that actually happened. I didn't have to to think up that narrative. And that part broke my heart. There were so many moments in Monumental where I had to remind myself that this had actually happened um, because it like it was such a a like tragic story, and even tragic in the Greek sense of the word, like Escalade. Um, and it was it like it just hit that much harder when I was like, wait a second, these are real people. Like this, this actually happened. So like, uh, so Aminder, uh, what are your thoughts on the good evil question? Um, oh, you have to excuse my dog just came up to me. Um, <laughs> you know, for me, like there's a little bit of in case my dog will listen to my answer. Um, it's a little bit like I didn't have to focus on the 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 good or evil off the my main characters. But I did have to think about um, how the two eyes, the community we don't really get to follow on such a um, specific level, how they um, appear, because I didn't want them to just be the bad guys. So many of um, the 
react like the stories are my real stories and i had to write the, these narratives with like assuming that all of these characters were well intentioned all these like two eyes so many of the microaggressions i've experienced like it's usually when someone is well intentioned and then says something that they really probably shouldn't have so i wanted to make that as real as possible so i think in that it, it found nuance that it's just based in reality and in that there is no good or evil but i'm going to have to start doing uh, finding my my sympathetic backstories to <laughs> my my evil characters from now on <laughs> Yeah, Willow, you 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 dropped a serious truth bomb on us with that answer. Uh, <laughs> I, I have to think about it a lot. <laughs> yeah, on a regular basis. Well, well, I I have to say I can't believe it's already been an hour. Um, there's so much more that I and imagine a lot of the audience wanted to wanted to ask of y'all, but I I have to say I think our time is up. Uh, it has been such a pleasure. Like I very easily could have had this conversation for another two hours. Uh, but I want to thank you all, Aminda Dhaliwal, G. Willow Wilson, Brian K. Mitchell, uh, not just for you know taking the time to, to chat with me and the rest of the audience, but to put out the incredible work that you have put out. I mean, you know, Cyclopedia Exotica and Woman World are amazing. Miss Marvel, Incredible Kingdom. We didn't even get to talk about Incredible yeah, Kingdom. Incredible Kingdom. Yeah. Willow, your your work with uh, the inimitable Christian Ward and mm -hmm. and Brian K. Mitchell, uh, monumental, um, absolutely monumental. I'm sure you've <laughs> never heard that joke before. <laughs> <laughs> I also want to thank uh, everybody at the Pen World at the Pen World Voices Festival and everyone at Pen America for making this possible. And with that, I want to wish you all a good night. Good night. Thank you.